Chapter 3, I Love to Laugh. I remember my first Gaither cruise to the Caribbean. At that time, the Gaither vocal band consisted of Bill Gaither, Michael English, Jim Murray, and me. I had just joined the group. This was my first cruise, and I was excited. We performed concerts at night, had seminars during the day, and stopped at wonderful ports of call, St. Thomas, St. Martin, and St. John Islands. And we ate. Breakfast, brunch, lunch, midday tea, dinner, and the infamous midnight buffet. A cruise is no time to diet. The way they feed you, it's a wonder the ship stays afloat. The only meal with assigned seating was dinner. Every night we dressed up in our finest suits and ate at the same table with the same group of people. I ate dinner every night with Michael English, Lisa English, Tanya Goodman Sykes, her husband Michael, and a few others. On the last night of the cruise, we had just begun eating our salads when a sweet elderly lady walked up to the table and started telling us how much she had enjoyed the cruise. She said, I know I really shouldn't do this, but I just had to stop by your table and let you know how much your music has blessed me this week. Michael English looked up from his plate and said, ma'am, we're trying to eat. Can't we have a moment's peace? Nobody comes to your table while you're eating and bothers you. The lady looked as if someone knocked the wind out of her. Oh, I'm sorry, she said, as she turned away, embarrassed. The blood drained out of my face. The room began to spin. I was in shock. I couldn't believe what I just heard. This sweet, precious lady was slinking away, her shoulders to the ground. She had been totally humiliated by a lead singer. I said, Michael. I can't believe what you just did. You've got to get up right now and apologize. He just stared at his plate. My eyes darted around the table. Wouldn't someone stand up and say something? They had known Michael for years. I was the new guy. I had just gotten here. Tanya? Lisa? Anybody? Won't somebody agree with me that Michael had just made a fool of himself? that he had just bruised the tender reed, negating everything we sang all week. Nobody moved. They just stared at their plates. Sad, pitiful stares. I wanted to slap the fool out of every one of them, condemn them all to the charred pits of hell, brush the dust off my shoes and get out of there. But I was trapped on a boat at a table with idiots, and it was too far to swim, so I just sat there trying to catch my breath. Just then, Michael looked up with a big grin on his face and said, gotcha. Lisa burst out laughing. Tanya and Michael gave each other a high five, and that little lady was guffawing so hard I thought she would faint. They had pulled an elaborate practical joke on me. I love to laugh. And I love the sound of laughter, too. Most of my friends are very funny and laugh a lot. David Musselman has been one of my good friends since college. He has a great laugh. It's big, loud, and kind of hoarse. He's an easy laugh, too. He'll laugh at anything. I remember when I was taping my video, The Last Word, at the Tivoli Theater in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I made sure David was sitting on the front row. We both have put on a few pounds since college, and he could barely squeeze into his seat, but he was there. He was on camera a lot, laughing, wiping his eyes, and loosening his tie. By the time the show was over, he'd laughed his shirt right out of his pants. I love it when laughter hits me so hard I have to bend over, grab my sides, and cough up a kidney. Laughing when you're not supposed to is the best like at funerals and weddings. It's so much more intense when you have to hold it in. The pressure builds, your shoulders shake, and your face turns the color of cherries. I love jokes with great punch lines and stories with endings that catch you by surprise. 
but I've never been good with practical jokes. They're too much work. You've got to plan, scheme, and delegate. You've got to be convincing, which is a nice way of saying you've got to be a good liar. But the main reason I don't do practical jokes is you've got to know how far to take it. And you've got to know when to stop. How far is too far? In 1978, I was in a van accident with Charles Hughes, David Musselman, and Dick Bernier. If you want to know the details, watch my This Is The Life video or read my book, Out of Control. In case you don't know already, I broke 11 bones in my body and I escaped the worst part of the crash. Our friend Charles was in a coma for eight months. As soon as Charles was well enough to go home from the hospital, I went to visit him. His doctors told us his short-term memory would be the last thing to return. I'd never known anyone who had lost his short-term memory, and I was especially curious, so I thought I'd have a little fun with Charles. I don't know if you'd call this a practical joke or not, but here's what I did. I asked Charles if he could remember the crusades we did before the wreck. He said he couldn't. You don't remember the stadiums we filled, I asked. He looked at me with excited doubt. You're kidding. He was beginning to buy it, so I continued. We packed them in by the thousands. We even had Donnie and Marie as our special guests. Really, he squealed. I was on a roll. Yes, sir, don't you remember the sermon you preached where, when you were filling in for Billy Graham while he was in the hospital getting his toes fixed? It was a worldwide broadcast from Rio de Janeiro. Everybody got saved. Even Billy Graham called from his hospital room to rededicate his life. You see what I'm talking about? I blew it. I went too far. Somewhere between getting his toes fixed and Rio de Janeiro, I lost him. The gig was over. My practical joke backfired. Charles knew I was making the whole thing up. I've gotten emails and letters from women who receive my internet newsletter remarks. There are currently more than 42,000 subscribers. Most of the subscribers understand the way the electronic newsletter system works, but some of my readers think I'm sending them secret messages. They say God told them I'm supposed to marry them, which is surprising because he hasn't mentioned it to me. The letters are a little scary sometimes, I have this picture in my head of a husky single gal pulling up in a pickup with a what would Jesus do bumper sticker, four kids in the back and a shotgun in one hand, a Bible in the other, in the other, pointing at me yelling, take a gander, kids, here's your new pappy. He's the one that's been writing us. Here is a sampling of some of the more interesting marriage proposals I've received. One, I normally don't do this, but God woke me up last night and told me I was I was to marry you, so call me. Another one, I've never written a letter like this before, but God told me we're supposed to have kids, so call me. If you reject me, you're rejecting God's will for your life, so call me. God told me we're going to have the prettiest children this side of Beijing, so call me. See, even God every now and then plays practical jokes. Isn't that wonderful? God does have a sense of humor. He's told all these women, I'm supposed to marry them. That's hysterical. He knows I can't do that. So he must be playing a practical joke. Either that or he's Mormon. <laughs>